subject of my talk is something which I have been working for 30 years now at the University of Campinas in Brazil. So uh, normally we learn in physics, engineering, electromagnetism through the four Maxwell's equations and Lorentz force law. They are all based on the field concept, electric field and magnetic field following the ideas of Faraday. But what I will be presenting here today, it's another completely different paradigm in electrodynamics. It was developed by Wilhelm Weber. He was a contemporary of Maxwell. He was born before Maxwell and died after Maxwell. He had a longer life and uh, he worked together with Gauss uh, in Göttingen. Uh, while Gauss was the director of the observatory, uh, Weber was the director of the Physics Institute at uh, Göttingen University. So they had a very close collaboration together. Uh, so while uh, uh, Maxwell was following in the footsteps of Faraday, developing the ideas of lines of force and fields, Weber was more like a Newtonian type of uh, thinking mind. So he was also trying to unify the known laws of electrodynamics, but with uh, an approach based on force, not on fields. So at his time, he knew the laws of Coulomb, which is analogous to Newton's law of gravitation, the force of ampere, not the circuital law, the force of ampere between current elements, which also falls as 1 over r square, but depends on the angle between the elements and the straight line connecting them. And he knew Faraday's law of induction, that if you change the current in the primary circuit, you induce a current in the secondary circuit. So Weber's idea, like others at the time, was no one knew what an electric current was. So his idea with others was that current is charged in motion. So if uh, currents are charged in motion, uh, I, I don't have anything with velocity in Coulomb's law, but in Ampere's law, I1, I2 should be V1, V2, velocity 1 times velocity 2. So he said, well, I must add something with the product of the two velocities in order to deduce Ampere's force from a generalized Coulomb's law. If a uh, current is charging motion, time variation of current is acceleration. So microscopically, Faraday's law of induction means if I accelerate a charge in the primary circuit, a charge in the secondary circuit will feel a force which depends on acceleration of that charge. So the third component of Weber's law depends on acceleration in order to deduce Faraday's law of induction. So that was the main idea of Weber. So here is the complete Weber electrodynamics, is in this slide, only this equation. The whole Weber's electrodynamics is here. So it is a generaliz generalization of Coulomb's force, which a component which depends on the relative velocity, dr by dt, and relative acceleration between the interacting charges. There is a constant there, c, which in the international system of units, it is 1 over square root of 2, mu naught, epsilon naught. Weber introduced this constant in electromagnetism. At that time, he didn't even know, not even the order of magnitude of this constant. Ten years later, he was the first to measure this constant. Weber was an experimentalist, not a theoretician. And when he made this measurement, it had nothing to do with optics. He measured the force between two electrified spheres. Then he discharged one of them and saw how did it affect a magnet nearby. And then he could uh, know how much current he could uh, produce with that sphere. 
and from these two measurements of force, he could obtain the value of that constant, which just turned out to be the same as light velocity in vacuum. So it was the first connection between electrodynamics and optics before Maxwell. What are the main properties of Weber's electrodynamics? When there is no relative motion between the two charges, when they are at rest, dr by dt, and the acceleration goes to zero, we return to the force of Coulomb and Gauss' law of electrostatics. It follows action and reaction, so there is conservation of linear momentum. Moreover, the force is along the straight line connecting the two particles, so there is also conservation of angular momentum. And two years later, Weber showed that his force could be deduced from this velocity-dependent potential energy. So there is conservation of kinetic plus potential energy. It was the first potential energy in physics which depend not only on the distance but also on velocity. Moreover, I won't go into details here, but you can de uh, derive Faraday's law of induction from Weber's electrodynamics. I won't go into details, but you can read Maxwell himself. The last chapter of his main book, The Treatise on Electricity and Magnetism, is wholly devoted to Weber's electrodynamics. And he shows that with Weber's force, we can deduce Faraday's law of induction in the general case. And also the so-called Ampere Circuital Law, the two of Maxwell's equations. But what called my attention and what made myself, André, to work with uh, Weber's electrodynamics was the property, what I call it is relational. It depends only on the distance between the two charges, velocity between the two charges, and acceleration between the two charges. This is so important to me because nowadays in the Lorentz force law, there is a com magnetic component, V cross B, where that velocity is not velocity between the charge and the magnet, but it is velocity of the charge relative to the observer. I, that, that never made sense to me because the charge is not interacting with the observer. It is interacting with other charges. So when I found Weber's in history of science textbooks, I said, that's what I believe. So I did begin to work with that. So, uh, those of you who, I don't want to go into too many details, but we have a, a book on uh, Weber's electrodynamics, which was published 25 years ago by Kluver. Nowadays, it is available by Springer. So later on, you can give a look if you wish. I will now talk about other subjects. Uh, Weber, when we begin with Weber, we deduce the force of ampere, which does not appear in the textbooks any longer. It is that on the top. It is a force between two current elements. It's similar to Newton, I1, I2 over R square, but depends on the angle between the two elements and each element in the straight line connecting them. In the textbooks nowadays in physics and engineering, we learn only the bottom line, which is analogous to Lorentz force or the law of Biot, Savart, and Grassmann. So there is a double cross product, and when we open that, we end up with that bottom line. The first component is analogous to the first of ampere, but there is a two here which is not there. But the last component is completely different. While this component of ampere is central, pointing along the connection between the two elements, the second component of Grassmann or Lorentz uh, points along the direction of one of the elements. So, for instance, if I have two elements, like on the top there, which they are orthogonal to one another, according to ampere, they do not, they do not exert forces on one another. According to Grassmann, on the other hand, the second one exerts a force on the first one upwards, but the first does not react back on the second. If, on the other hand, if they are aligned with one another, there is no force according to, to Grassmann, with what we learn in the textbook, but according to Ampere, they should repel one another. 
So they are very different. So how can we forget about Ampere and keep only Grassmann? Because they have an amazing property. When I integrate the force of a closed circuit of an arbitrary shape acting on the current element of another circuit, they agree with one another. So if we have two or more closed circuits, I cannot distinguish them. And so as uh, Ampere's law is not compatible with Einstein's theory of relativity, because that's based on Lorentz, in the textbooks, they simply deleted Ampere's force. We don't see that any longer. But nowadays, people are doing experiments with uh, open circuits, or they are uh, looking for effects on a portion of a circuit due to the reminder. That begins with Ampere himself. There is electromagnetic impulse pendulum experiment, exploding wire phenomena showing this longitudinal repulsive force and so on. I won't go into the details. I will just show here what did Maxwell think about these two forces, because he knew both of them. In his book, The Treatise, he said the following when he was comparing the force of Ampere and the force of Grassmann, that one which we learn in the textbooks. Of these four different assumptions, that of Ampere is undoubtedly the best, since it is the only one which makes the force on the two elements not only equal and opposite, but in the straight line which joins them. That is Maxwell because Ampere is central force. He said that is undoubtedly the best. He made this, the general assessment of Ampere's work. The experimental investigation by which Ampere established the laws of the mechanical action between electric currents is one of the most brilliant achievements in science. The whole theory and experiment seems as if it had leaped full grown and full armed from the brain of the Newton of electricity. It is perfect in form and unassailable in accuracy. And it is summed up in a formula from which all the phenomena may be deduced and which must always remain the cardinal, most important formula of electrodynamics. Despite this amazing statement by Maxwell, Ampere's force does not appear in any textbooks nowadays, in the last 100 years. It disappeared from the textbooks. It is no longer the most important formula of electrodynamics. It disappeared. Those of you who wish to have more details, uh, I have two other books. One compared Ampere and Grassmann, but I call your attention to the right one, which is a complete commented translation from French to English of Ampere's main book on the electrodynamics. In 200 years, Ampere was never translated to German, to English, to, a to any language. So, but now you have that available completely in English. So I suggest you to read that, okay? I would just talk another subject. N usually, we connect the name of Maxwell with the wave equation. Well, if we, we read the history of science, we know that the propagation of electromagnetic signals was first obtained by Weber and Kirchhoff. Kirchhoff was a student of Weber, utilizing Weber's electrodynamics before Maxwell. In particular, both of them, they did obtain the telegraphy equation, which is in the bottom here, which is the wave equation with damping, if there is resistance in the wire. We think that everything re related to waves came from Maxwell. Quite, that's not true. That's quite the opposite. As a matter of fact, Maxwell introduced the displacement current in Ampere circuit law in 1864-73. So there is, this is the famous displacement current of Maxwell. Where did Maxwell take that constant C? He did borrow it from Weber's electrodynamics. Weber had introduced this constant. Maxwell knew the value of this constant, which, which had been first measured by Weber and found light velocity. And Maxwell knew that Weber and Kirchhoff had obtained the wave equation with Weber's electrodynamics. Kirchhoff's paper, in particular, 
was published in 1857 in the Annales de Physique and then translated in the Philosophical Magazine to English. Maxwell was aware of these works. Um, so that is half of my talk, okay, more of historical approach. Now I will talk about the uh, distinction between Weber and Lorentz and something very interesting which comes out of it. The main, so uh, at the top we have uh, Weber's force law. At the bottom we have the famous Lorentz force law, which we learn in all textbooks. The main difference between these two, well, one is based on fields, the other there is no field, it's only a force law. But the main difference is that in Lorentz force, it depends on the position and velocity of the test charge the charge which is feeling the force. But there is no component in Lorentz force which depends on the acceleration of the test charge. With uh, Weber's force, on the other hand, these are two dots, the two accelerations appear there, acceleration of charge one and acceleration of charge two. So they are very different, in particular in this component which depends on the acceleration of the test charge. So. Uh, we just skip this. So here it is the main distinction between the two uh, formulations of electrodynamics. Suppose, for instance, this is plastic. I rub it in my hair, so it is charged now. Suppose I charge the walls and ceiling of this room. Okay. Suppose this is spherical. What? And if I charge it and it, I move it with my hand in a circle, for instance. Will the charge here feel a force exerted by this spherical shell? According to Lorentz force, no. Because the charged shell uh, generates only an electric field in the outside. There is no electric nor magnetic field inside. So the force, according to Lorentz, goes to zero. But according to Weber, the force is not zero. If I try to accelerate, uh, the force will depend on the amount of charge which there is in the walls, okay? So they are not the same. And what happens if I spin the spherical shell? According to classical electromagnetism, in this case, the shell will generate a uniform magnetic field inside, just like an infinite solenoid. In the outside, it, it will be a dipole field but in the inside it will be a uniform magnetic field. So the force will be QV cross B, this component here. With Weber's law, when you integrate Weber's force, you have the component of the previous slide, but there is also a centrifugal component and a Coriolis component. This Coriolis component, this two and this 12, they cancel and we return to the magnetic component of Lorentz. But Weber has two other components which do not appear in Lorentz. So nowadays people are beginning to make experiments to test these two predictions of Weber's law. Now I will finish my talk um, mentioning what Walt Thornhill told this morning about Weber's planetary model of the atom. There is something just fascinating about Weber. So here we have Weber's force law, and I will apply it with Newton's second law of motion, F equals ma. So Weber's force, if the velocities, if they are small compared with light velocity, I can neglect the middle term here. So the first component, cool, Coulomb, will be charge times the electric field. That, that's just Coulomb. But, but Weber has a component here which depends on the acceleration of the test charge. So that MW is what I call Weber's mass. I can pass this Weber's mass to the right-hand side. So it, I will have a similar to Coulomb's law, but with an effective mass. And this M minus MW, this MW, this Weberian mass, is proportional to the product of the two charges and falls as 1 over R. 
if I have, for instance, two positive charges, this MW will be positive. So M minus MW can become negative, zero, or positive. In particular, when the two charges, the, if they are very close to one another, this component will be huge, can be larger than the usual mass of the particle. In particular, if I consider two positrons, these two fundamental particles, when, so normally they repel one another, but the, if they are very close, they will begin to attract one another instead of repelling, because they will behave as if they had negative inertial mass. When will it happen? If you just put the numbers, mass and charge of the positron, you find, according to Weber's law, that they will begin to attract at a distance of 10 to minus 15 meters, which is just the right size of the nuclei. So Weber predicted this model of the atom, that is in his writings, in the 70s, 1870s, and 1880s. He predicted a model just like this, negative charges following uh, uh, orbits around the uh, elliptical orbits around the nuclei, and the nuclei was composed of positive charges which were attracting one another due to a negative mass effect. So this is just remarkable and completely forgotten. In the textbooks, we learn only about the plum pudding model of Thompson, and then the Hutterford and Bohr model. They never mention Weber, but it is just amazing. Why it is amazing? It, is, it has remarkable properties. First one, Weber's was a prediction, 1870, 1880, which was made before the discovery of the electron, before Baumer spectral series, before Hutterford scattering experiment. Bohr's model, on the other hand, was created, made up, in order to be compatible with these experimental findings. Weber presented a formula for his critical distance below which two charges of the same sign would uh, attract one another. But he could not calculate its value because the electrons and the positrons were unknown. But when we utilize in the modern values of pos positron, for instance, in Weber's formula, we obtain that the critical distance will be 10 to minus 15 meters, which is just the right size of the nuclei. This cannot be a coincidence, I believe. Maybe it is, but I don't think so. So Weber gives a justification, reason why the nuclei is so small. In modern physics, we need to postulate nuclear forces to stabilize the nuclei. With Weber's, we don't need that because the nuclei are already stabilized by purely electrodynamic forces. So it is already an unification of nuclear physics with electrodynamics. And it was everything predicted before all the experiments by Hutterford and so on. So those of you who wish, we have a, a book on this planetary model of the atom with the late Herr Wiederkehr, which unfortunately died a few years ago, and Frau Wolfschmidt of Hamburg University. So Weber's electrodynamics is extremely powerful. In the last few years, there has been a renewed interest in Weber's electrodynamics due to novel experiments and new theoretical developments. Thank you very much.